If Wikipedia is a source to be believed, Doom 3 is coming up to its 10th anniversary this August, so I thought it only appropriate to give it a much overdue review. Actually, that isn't entirely true. I bought the BFG edition off Steam in the sale and started recording footage when I had a bit of a nostalgia gasm, and after seeing that it had taken up 70 gig of my precious hard drive space, thought I'd best do one. Now, for all you children out there who don't know what Doom is, and for everyone else who does know, and by that fact alone would like to see some footage that will probably make them play for Doom 2 again, here's a little intro to why the Doom series is something I hold very dear. First person shooters are bloody everywhere these days, and for the most part are different variations of the same game, a bit like buying different coloured Converse. Sure, they suit you better depending on what your outfit is, but as soon as it starts to rain you realise they really aren't the ideal shoe of choice. Dune 2, however, was the first FPS game I played and came storming into my child's brain with huge steel toe cap boots of fire retardant rocket launcher mounted manliness. Up until then I had mostly been sat in my pyjamas playing Psycho Fox and the Master System. Then one day we went to buy a PC we saw advertised in the bargain pages. What, you don't remember the bargain pages? You make me sick. Anyway, after a few weeks playing Python Kai on Windows 3.1, my dad brought home Doom 2 that a guy in the pub had pirated for him, and thus my mind was tarnished forever. Gore and horror go hand in hand in games today, and often don't get a passing glance, but when I first played this I was genuinely frightened. Everything was new to me, the perspective, the adult aesthetic, the 3D environment, the music, and most importantly it was the first game I had played that made me feel genuinely uncomfortable. Games prior were mostly a jolly run from left to right until you fought a boss and got to the next level, but Doom 2 had big maze-like structures to every dungeon with multiple levels, hidden rooms, enemies to fight, ammo to collect and no real hint as to what you had to do. The enemies in the game were genuinely unsettling for the time. As soon as they saw you, all they wanted to do was see you dead, and they would grunt and scream until they either succeeded or you turned them into pulp. Another thing that set this game apart from other games was the level structure. Most games between levels gave the impression that you were on a journey that was comprised of many different locations that plonked you in intermittent conflicts along the way. Doom 2, however, starts as it means to go on, by dropping you on two unsuspecting zombie men in the subtitled Hell on Earth, where the planet's buildings appear to have been terraformed appropriately into devilish biomechanical settings with not so friendly demons screwing throughout. And the path you must traverse at no point feels like it lets you slip past any of the world it intends to have you experience, it made you feel trapped, and getting further in the game only exacerbated that feeling, in a good way. As you drew towards the game's climax, you encountered larger amounts of enemies on larger maps with appropriate scaling difficulty and new weapons, and this was no short game that could be completed in one sitting. It took weeks, maybe even months, to complete on my first go around, and when I finally did shoot enough rockets into that giant brain, I felt truly exhausted from the experience. This began my love for first person shooters, and subsequently spawned my current hatred for most modern first person shooters, and in the decade leading up to the release of Doom 3, I had been spoiled with some of the best gaming had to offer. Doom 3 doesn't look overly impressive by today's standards, but this was a real big deal at the time. The character models, lighting, animation were all a step up from everything we had been playing. It was one of those releases that made PC owners start looking at new graphics cards. Luckily to my surprise, my Radeon 9700 Pro ran it perfectly, and after getting my sister to buy it for me from game as I was a year off being 18 at the time, I read that instruction manual cover to cover on the bus ride home. The sequel to the game that had started my gaming addiction had finally been released, and good or bad, I was ready to about shit my pants. That might have seemed like a big setup, but it's relevant as this is the first time I've played Doom 3 since then, and I know that my judgement at the time would have been clouded as all I can really remember was that I was amazed by the graphics and sound effects, and that I was pissed off that there was no dual barrel shotgun, so I went into this with a fresh mind. Do know that while I am playing the BFG re-release, I will still be reviewing the game as it is, and not reviewing how the versions compare to the original, although one or two things might come up later on. When we begin, after some awesome rock music, we are shown a cutscene introducing us as an unnamed space marine who has been shipped into UAC's Mars base via the Dark Star ship, movie reference there, to investigate strange goings on. Now that is a very vague synopsis of the plot, but this is Doom remember so plot isn't what we're here for really. However, this is 10 years later so some plot has to be present and to its credit Doom 3 doesn't shove it down your throat but lets you discover it to your own content. What makes this a welcome addition to the Doom franchise is that it is completely down to your own discretion whether or not you wish to learn about what is going on or just simply run through blasting away monsters. Startup plot can never be avoided however and after a quick look around at the nice serviceable graphics and a cutscene involving some sinister dialogue involving a man we know to be evil because he's the only person wearing glasses we are free to progress with our first objective playing a game of super turbo turkey puncher free. After which we follow the most adorable of combat droids to the security point where we are given our first weapon in the game in the form of a pistol and a few rounds of ammo. We are then sent to the old communications building to search for a scientist who is believed to have been last seen heading there before he went missing. When you do finally reach him the shit hits the fan as the trailer for the game is played on the monitor and the gates of hell open turning everyone into the walking dead. 
everyone that is except for you and a few conveniently placed scientists along the way, but if that was the end of everyone, the game would have been pretty short. This is where we are first introduced to the meat and potatoes of the FPS game, the shooting mechanics. And right off the bat we know that this isn't Doom 2, not by a long shot, but if you go into this game comparing it to its predecessors, you're going to have a disappointing experience. However, if you judge it on how well it works within its genre, it's fantastically well crafted to its intention. Doom 3 is a slow paced, weapon focused shooter, and by that I mean each weapon has been designed to operate in its own personality, with appropriately felt weight, speed, feedback and effectiveness. They all feel physical, like they have moving parts which can't be manipulated to work any faster and you have to plan your strategy to their pace rather than yours. The enemies in the game also adhere to the same level of discipline, although whether that be for the better or worse is down to your own personal preference. As you make your way through the first few stages you will discover that this has its heart set on being a claustrophobic corridor shooter, opposed to a huge map circle strafing rocket fest of the originals and behaviourally the enemies have shifted along with their methods of encounter. Doom 3 plays heavy on the making you jump factor, something Dead Space has made a name for itself with, and while this works to a degree for the first few hours of the game, you do start to notice familiar patterns emerging in the level design. Most combat is done on a one-to-one -one basis early on, and it isn't hard to predict where the enemy is going to appear from. Chances are, if there is a closed door, there will be an imp hiding behind it, or if one spawns in front of you, you better check behind because there's a 90% chance there will be one behind you as well. This does sometimes unfortunately turn Doom 3 into a game of guess the trigger point and it doesn't help that so many of the hallways and doors are copy and pasted so that you know exactly what to expect with each setup. This can be forgiven though as shooting things in the face never ceases to remain fun and at the time when it was released computers didn't really have the power to render hundreds of characters on screen at one time. The first half of the game is mostly a spook house ride of enemies emerging from dark corners whilst you collect PDAs, keycards and combinations to open doors and storage lockers in order to advance to the next area. As you advance, the encounter rate of enemies will increase somewhat, but not to the degree needed to necessitate the amount of weapons and ammo you have accrued. Now this is the first instance I felt the intervene of this certain Bethesda released edition. I played this on hard mode, and I don't remember there being quite so much ammo, health and armour scattered around the game the first time I played it. Almost every single room has something for you to pick up, and I breezed through maybe the first 5 hours with constantly maxed out health and ammo. And whilst we're on the subject, something else I don't like that they have changed is the torch is now chest mounted and they seem to have kept the bizarre magical way your shotgun reloads two shells at once, which if I remember correctly they fixed in a patch for the original release. Once the game gets some momentum going however, we are introduced to all our old favourites and some resemblance of the game we once remembered so fondly, the beloved weapons from the original games of the first down that point, each one of our old friends is back and they look great and sound even better. There is only really one new addition here in form of the machine gun and later on the soul cube but we'll get onto that and they all have their strengths just as they did in the original. On the enemy front we have a returning cast with some omissions, mostly you'll be fighting imps and zombies which act as simple cannon fodder, their presence simply acting as a sign that you're heading in the right direction. You will also come across the Keiko demon, if that's how it's pronounced, the ball pig, the lost souls, revenant and later on in the game the archvile who is just as a pain in the arse as in the original, resurrecting characters and burning you alive. The Monkey Bus, who unfortunately are more of a boss fight than a regular appearance, and the Baron of Hell. There are also some new additions in form of Trites, which are basically the spider heads from the thing, Wraiths, which can teleport around and probably won't ever hit you, Commando Zombies, which are big hawking versions of regular zombies, although now they either have a chainsaw, chain gun, or a big tentacle arm, and Cherubs, which are the best of the new bunch, being flying babies that swoop and scream at you when they die. Despite having been taken from a game that was fast, frantic and loud, all of these reoccurrences have been perfectly reformed in such a way that they feel completely different yet familiar, and that is to the game's credit. Where the game falls down however is with its pacing, and this is made retrospectively apparent in the last two or so hours of the game. This isn't a short game by any means, I clocked in at just under 10 hours and didn't bother to read most of the PDAs or take my time exploring, but even still I'd say for at least 5 of those hours I spent waiting for something better to happen. There really isn't much in terms of variety when it comes to location setting, and looking at the same walls, doors, corridors and predictable enemy placements does get pretty dull in the first half. This wouldn't be so bad if there was any sense of a gameplay curve here, usually either the enemies would get harder, or there would be more of them, or the environments would change giving you new obstacles to consider in combat, but none of this really happens, the game is as hard as it is an hour in, as in 5 hours in, and with the collection of weapons you have acquired, if anything it just gets easier. 
To be kind to Doom 3, it does really ramp up towards the end, and where most games put their boring padding in the middle, Doom decides to get it out of the way right at the beginning, so when things do get really interesting, they remain interesting right the way through to the end. Around about the time Commando Zombies and Teleporters are introduced, the game reaches what I consider to be the start of a Doom game. Prior to this, we've been playing pretty much what is a precursor to Dead Space, active screen panels included, but now we shift from slow and brooding to increased amounts of enemies, difficulty and environment size. Areas are now tougher to get through and you will become more thoughtful with the conservation of your plasma ammo and rockets as you don't want to become unstuck with a room full of big boys that are all being resurrected. Also enemies which you'd probably only seen once or twice in passing are reintroduced and we finally feel like we're heading towards locations more relevant to the plot that you may or may not have been keeping up with to this point. As it turns out, if you haven't guessed already, there has been an archaeological dig on Mars that has uncovered some ancient ruins of previous civilizations and a relic called the Soul Cube, which was once used to keep the monsters of Hell at bay who have been once again slipping over onto our turf. As the appearance of Hell grows further and further throughout Mars, we are treated to transformed environments of biological mutation which are much more resemblant of previous games and eventually we find ourselves being sucked down to the underworld itself. This for me is where the game should have started its development from. This is the doom we all remember, the trapped feeling is coming back, the hesitant feeling of not running into areas in fear of getting mobbed by huge hulking demons, lack of ammo and weapons, the ambient sound effects, it's what we've been waiting for all these hours. Once you are out of hell you are back in the base, but now things are a lot different. For one you have the soul cube, which once you kill 5 demons can be thrown for an insta kill on an enemy of your choice to replenish your health. The pace is ramped up, there seems to be a heightened sense of urgency to your exploration, and for the first time I noticed something resembling music. Which is sometimes masked in such a way that it could be considered environmental sounds, but it's there to let you know that things are getting more serious now. It's unfortunate then that this is the start of the game's finale, which throws in a few more bosses, the hardest of which gets you the famous BFG if you didn't previously, and a satisfying yet way too easy last boss battle with the Cyber Demon. I think because of how good the last act is, it formed an opinion of the first half of the game being boring, but I don't think this is the case. The game is, from start to finish, a very enjoyable experience. The combat is solid, killing things is always fun, and despite the poor level design, they've gotten the environment down. To fully appreciate this game, you have to be playing with no distractions and the sound turned way up. The sound effects won't make you jump, and if anything, they do too much to signal that an enemy is nearby or has spawned, but they have an oddly realistic clarity to them which really helps immerse you further in the game. Doom 3 is real good fun, and the worst I can say about it is that the end section is twice as much fun as the rest of the game, and if they had started there and ended with the Resurrection of Evil expansion, it would have been all the better for it. Personally, I prefer the original edition of Doom 3, as I believe it was a little bit harder, and come on, if you're going to release a game whose main problem the first time round was not including the double-barrel shotgun featured in the expansion pack, why would you leave it out the second time round and clearly leave a blank space in the inventory that never gets filled, just to tease me like a double-barrel bitch I am? A few last words about the big friendly giant edition before I wrap this up for good. It does include the original copy of Doom 2, however you can't change the controls to your own key bindings, which if you're me and don't want to play with an Xbox pad, is a dick move. Also, if you do load the game with a 360 pad in by accident, then every interaction then on will have the Y button prompt on the screen, which really annoyed me more than it should. I actually had a really good time playing Doom 3 again, and if you haven't played it, you really should check it out as it's not very expensive, especially if you are a fan of Dead Space and want something, in my opinion, better. It has its shortcomings, and most of them are what we were disappointed with 10 years ago, but like back then, it can be forgiven. And remember, this was the first game to be released using id's Tech 4 engine, which set the benchmark really high for any other titles that were being developed with it. So for a showcase of what the engine could do, it certainly wasn't a bad one. Thanks for watching, and as always leave a comment if you wish, and let's all keep our fingers crossed for Doom 4.